Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for the eighth annual meeting of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum, hosted by the Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry, and the New Energy and Industrial Technology Development Organization. My name is Sugano Rico, and I'm honored to be a MC for this session. Now, let us begin technology system three, nuclear power as a power source for decarbonization. First, I would like to introduce the two moderators for this session, Professor Richard K. Lester and Dr. Aya Rita Kohola. Professor Richard K. Lester is an Innovation for Cool Earth Forum steering committee member and associate provost and um, at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And Dr. Aya Rita Kohola is an Innovation for Cool Earth Forum Steering Committee member, delegate of the Consultative Commission on Industrial Change, and advisor in EU affairs. Now I would like to introduce you the speakers for today's session. Dr. Ashley E. Finan, Director, National Reactor Innovation Center, Idaho National Labo Lab Laboratory. Mr. Kanzaki Yurugi, Director, Nuclear Systems Engineering Department, Nuclear Energy Systems, Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Limited. Dr. Myagu Marajab Odotswetswag, Researcher, IS Process Experiment Group, HTGR Research and Development Center, Japan Atomic Energy Agency. And Dr. Aditi Bauma, Assistant Research Scientist, Department of Nuclear Engineering and Radiological Sciences, University of Michigan. Visiting Scholar, Project on Managing the Atom, Belfort Center for Science and International Affairs, Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Now I would like to ask Professor Richard K. Lester to moderate this session. Professor Lester, if you please. Thank you very much. And good morning in Tokyo. Uh, good evening from the United States. And I'm not quite sure what the right thing is to say to our colleagues in Europe, including my co-chair for this session, Dr. Korhola, where it's the middle of the night. Uh, perhaps it's best just to say, we're sorry to disturb you. Uh, in any case, uh, a warm welcome to everyone who's with us uh, for this concurrent session of the eighth annual meeting of the Innovation for Cool Earth Forum. And uh, I'd especially like to welcome our panelists today. Um, and you've heard um, who they are. I will have a chance to introduce them briefly myself shortly. Uh, but just to uh, say a few more words uh, about myself, uh, my name is Richard Lester. In addition to being the Associate Provost at MIT with responsibility for MIT's international activities, I'm also the Japan Steel Industry Professor of Nuclear Science and Engineering at MIT. I also serve as Chair of the uh, Council of Advisors of the Global Forum on Nuclear Education, Science, Technology, and Policy at the OECD. And the purpose of this new forum is to build bridges between the worldwide nuclear academic community and nuclear policymakers in countries around the world. The topic of today's session, as we've heard, is nuclear energy as a power source for decarbonization. And before we turn to our panelists, I'd just like to say a few words about this topic. For my whole career, I've been a professor of nuclear science and engineering, and it's been my privilege to work with generations of students and to see what they've been able to do to push the limits of the possible in the nuclear field. And I've also had the privilege of meeting students in many other countries. And what I've noticed is how many of them, regardless of their home country, 
want to contribute to the world's efforts to address the climate emergency. And so I'm very glad that the subject of this panel is the role of nuclear energy in decarbonization. We know that climate change is one of the greatest challenges that the world faces, both in terms of its potential impacts and in terms of the sheer scale of the international cooperation that is needed to tackle it. And to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions later this century, we'll need to pursue two tracks simultaneously and at fast forward speed. On track one, we need to go as far as we can, as fast as we can with the technologies and policies that we have now. But this won't be enough to get us to where we need to be. And so on track two, we need to invest in, invent and deploy new technologies and tools. And nuclear science and technology will play a crucial role on both tracks. On track one, existing nuclear technologies will be essential to achieve rapid reductions in carbon emissions from the power grid, as long as they can be operated safely and economically. On track two, new nuclear technologies, both fission and fusion, will very likely be needed for deeper reductions in carbon emissions, not just for a carbon neutral power grid, but also for tackling the other 60% of global carbon emissions that don't originate from the electric power sector. And perhaps we will also need nuclear to provide the immense amounts of zero carbon energy that will be needed to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, which many assessments say will be essential to augment the effort to reduce emissions if we're to achieve the net zero goal. And we're going to be discussing both of these tracks at today's session. And we're very fortunate to have four outstanding panelists to help us understand the nuclear role. Each of them will make a short presentation and then we shall move into discussion. And our first speaker is Dr. Ashley Finan uh, of the director of the National Reactor Innovation Center at the Idaho National Lab in the United States. Thank you, Dr. Finan, and please start the video. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Ashley Finan, and I'm director of the National Reactor Innovation Center, which is a national Department of Energy program in the United States. I'm delighted to be part of this panel today and would like to, to thank the hosts for having me to participate. Um, I'll have the pleasure of speaking with you about what advanced nuclear is, um, why it's important for climate change, and how we are working to demonstrate advanced nuclear energy projects in the United States. Advanced nuclear energy encompasses a broad range of different types of technologies seeking to meet the needs of diverse markets. In general, it's categorized in terms of size, ranging from micro reactors, which are very small, less than 10 megawatts electric, through small modular reactors, um, and then medium and large reactors. And advanced reactors use a variety of different coolant types in order to reach higher temperatures that can be more useful for advanced applications, um, in order to achieve improved economics, improved safety characteristics, and other key improvements over past generations. The top reason that we're excited about advanced nuclear energy is that it can help us meet our global emission reduction goals. And this, this slide shows just a very small example of how that works and why advanced nuclear can be such an important contributor. Electricity generation is, is very local and every market is different. So this is a one market, it's not applicable to the whole world, but it's illustrative. This is a study that was done for Energy Northwest, which is a U.S. utility in uh, Washington, Oregon, and parts of Idaho and Montana. And they looked at how they could achieve 100% carbon-free electricity by 2045. And what they found was that when they looked to achieve that with 100% renewable energy, they needed to add an enormous amount of capacity. If they instead 
instead used a lot of renewable energy, but included just about six and a half gigawatts of nuclear energy. They were able to reduce the installed capacity by 91 gigawatts, um, you know, roughly having the installed capacity, actually even more than, than half was removed. That saves a lot of cost, um, a lot of system costs, and a lot of land area, which is critically important in areas that don't have a lot of spare land or may not have um, a lot of renewable energy resources. Using these firm zero emitting resources like nuclear can bring us to the most cost effective and most reliable solutions to decarbonizing our electric power sector. When we look to complete decarbonization of our economy, that goes beyond electricity, and we need to look at our entire energy resource requirements. Nuclear energy can also meet needs in non-electric power areas like industrial processes. So this is a diagram just showing some of the vision. There's a lot of work going on throughout the world right now um, to prepare advanced nuclear reactors to be highly applicable to non-electric power applications. In order to realize this vision of advanced nuclear contributing to deep decarbonization, we need to demonstrate and deploy advanced nuclear energy to make it really an option. We see a lot of opportunities to achieve that in this current decade, um, including demonstration of microreactors in the early 2020s, uh, larger demonstrations in the late 2020s, and, and operating SMRs um, further out into the 2020s. The National Reactor Innovation Center has a vision of assisting with the demonstration of at least two advanced reactors by the end of 2025 and having advanced nuclear available commercially by 2030. We're working to achieve that through our mission to inspire stakeholders and the public, to empower innovators to test and demonstrate their technologies, and to deliver successful outcomes through efficient coordination of partners and resources. Very briefly, one example of how we're empowering innovators is by refurbishing old, old existing facilities to host demonstration reactors again. And this dome testbed is, is one of our pivotal examples of that, where we're taking a dome from the experimental breeder, breeder reactor and we're going to outfit it so that innovators can come in and demonstrate their technologies there. We're also focused on addressing cost um, including developing advanced construction technologies that can reduce the time and cost associated with construction, um, doing a lot of digital engineering, and focusing on construction readiness and factory and manufacturing. And we're focused on proactive impact management, looking at environmental impacts, at um, cultural and biological impacts at the outset and making sure that we understand those and we can mitigate those. stakeholders, to give them tools to understand the opportunities here, and also to give innovators Thank you, Ashley. Um, and our next speaker is Yurugi Kanzaki. And uh, if we could please start the video. My name is Yurugi Kanzaki, Director of Nuclear Systems Engineering Department of Mitsubishi Heavy Industries, MHI. I would like to explain MHI's contribution to carbon neutrality through the use of nuclear technology. In July this year, the Japanese government announced a draft of the sixth strategic energy plan. Here, I have highlighted three major points that is related to the nuclear policy described in the draft strategic energy plan. The first one is 
energy mix of nuclear energy at 20% to 22% in 2030. The second one is continuous utilization of nuclear energy to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And the last one is promotion of innovative technology research and development, such as new types of reactors. From this, we understand that the Japanese government is intending to continue using nuclear power in the future, along with promoting research and development of innovative technologies. In the following pages, I will introduce MHI's contribution to carbon neutrality. MHI's nuclear business has short, mid, and long-term objectives which aligns with Japan's nuclear energy policy to achieve carbon neutrality. Nuclear energy is an important baseload power source as it is a carbon-free, large-scale, and stable power source and ultimately helps to achieve energy security. Therefore, we believe nuclear energy is a crucial tool in achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. With this understanding, I will explain our nuclear energy business and our current initiatives as described on this slide. First, in the country and in the coming years, MHI will focus on the restart of existing nuclear plants. In parallel, we will work on the development of a next generation pressurized water reactor with an anticipated commercial operation by the mid-2030s. These efforts will provide means for society to significantly reduce carbon dioxide emissions in the power generation sector by maintaining a certain level of carbon-free nuclear power. Additionally, we will develop new types of reactors such as small modular reactors, high temperature gas cooled reactors, and fast reactors, in order to satisfy the diversified market needs of the 2040s. These innovation efforts are currently supported by METI's program called NEXIP. Furthermore, from a long term perspective, we will work to make fusion reactors a reality by continuing to leverage our experience, which is considered the dream energy source for society. As introduced on this slide, from a long-term perspective of 2050 and beyond, MHI will steadily proceed with its business in order to realize carbon neutrality by effectively utilizing nuclear energy, a power source that does not emit carbon dioxide. One of our initiatives in the future nuclear technologies is the development of a next generation pressurized water reactor, PWR. MHI believes that nuclear energy will remain a necessary power source both now and into the future. This is why we are working on the research and the development of a next generation PWL with the world's highest level of safety, using innovative and latest technologies in addition to our experience from constructing and maintaining 24 PWLs in Japan. In response to the accident at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, we reinforced not only safety measures for all types of hazards, but also developed an entirely new safety concept by incorporating the latest knowledge and innovative technologies, such as countermeasures against accident scenarios involving postulated events related to a molten core and radioactive material release. 
These added measures, along with many other enhancements to the plant design, are intended to ensure operational safety is achieved and maintained throughout the life of the plant. Even though operational events are extremely rare and unlikely, ensuring the safety and acceptance of residents local to the plant is very important to MHI. We will work to develop this new type of reactor and firm in our commitment to achieving the world's highest level of safety, all while aiming for its commercialization in the mid-2030s. There are new reactor types, which we envision will be realized in the future. One of these reactors is an integrated small reactor. In recent years, small modular reactors, SMRs, have been a major focus in many countries because of its low initial cost and its compatibility to distributed power source. MHI has been developing a small reactor in the 300 megawatt class for a small scale grid type application. Additionally, MHI is considering a smaller SMR, which is a ship-mounted mobile type reactor, which can be used for emergency power supply to remote islands. Our integrated small reactor adapts the concept of an integrated reactor, where cooling systems and main structures are contained within the reactor vessel. By utilizing this concept, the possibility of loss of current accident is in principle eliminated as it is self-contained. Additionally, MHI is pursuing the development of various countermeasures which are intended to ensure external hazards, terrorism, intentional aircraft crash, and so on are accounted for in our reactor designs. This will ultimately ensure the continued safe and secure operation of our reactors. The next new type of reactor is the High Temperature Gas Cooled Reactor, HTGR. The most remarkable feature of the HTGR is its high outlet temperature gas of over 900 degrees Celsius. This reactor can be used not only for electric power generation to the grid, but also for other purposes, such as district heat supply to communities or industries. Furthermore, by design, the HTGL has robust and inherent safety which ensures that a core meltdown is not realized, all because of its unique reactor core and fuel characteristics. MHI sees HTGL's great possibility in its ability to stably produce a large amount of hydrogen, all carbon free, by using the high temperature gas of 900 degrees Celsius. Currently, we are making progress on the development of hydrogen production technology that can be utilized at this high temperature and will ultimately help us realize the full potential of the HTGR. There are many potential applications for mass-generated hydrogen, but one application which MHI believes strongly in is with hydrogen reduction used to manufacture steel. With a carbon-free source like the HTGR, a significant reduction of carbon dioxide emissions in steel industry can be realized. This technology is another form of contribution which MHI is making to achieve carbon neutrality by nuclear energy. Finally, 
our final reactor design to discuss is our microreactor. A microreactor is unique given its small size and ability to be stored in a shipping container. This allows it to be easily transported and used for either power and heat sources. Despite its small power output, the portability characteristic allows for more versatility to support public needs. It is our belief that a microreactor will satisfy diversified market needs, such as being a crucial energy source for remote and or disaster-stricken areas. In summary, I would like to reiterate the importance of nuclear energy to carbon neutrality. MHI is proceeding with the development of next generation PWL, in addition to supporting Japanese utilities for restart of existing nuclear plants. For the mid to long term, MHI will continue pursuing the development of new types of reactors, which ultimately will satisfy the need to meet diversified market needs and lead to the achievement of a carbon neutral world. Through our vast efforts, MHI will actively contribute towards the achievement of carbon neutrality by 2050. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Yurigi san for that extremely comprehensive presentation. Now, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Otsetseg Miyagmarjav, and uh, she is with the Japan Atomic Energy Agency. Please start the video. Hello, my name is Miyagmarjav Otsetseg. I'm a researcher at Japan Atomic Energy Agency. Thank you for giving opportunity to speak today at Innovation for Cool Earth Forum 2021. My presentation is on development of hydrogen production technology using high temperature gas cooled reactor at JEA. This slide shows the role of HDGR for carbon neutrality in Japan. Our Prime Minister Suga declared that Japan aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 46% in fiscal year 2030, compared to the fiscal year 2013 levels. The bar chart here shows greenhouse gas emission in Japan. It decreases gradually, but it's not enough. To achieve this ambitious goal, a reduction by additional 34% is needed by 2030, and 88% by 2050. Therefore, use of HDGR is the key to achieve greenhouse gas emission reduction goal by producing hydration and using for nuclear steel making, fuel cell vehicles, and so on. JAA has been developing HTGR technology since 1960s. Thermal power of HTTR is 30 megawatt, outlet temperature is 950 degrees Celsius. First critical was achieved in 1998, in 2010, we achieved an operation at the world's highest 950 degrees Celsius for 50 days, and also we conducted lots of forced cooling tests that confirming natural cooling of reactor and so on. Nuclear Regulation Authority officially approved the start of HTGR, and then we just restarted our HTGR on July of this year. HTGR can supply heat about 950 degrees Celsius, which is significantly higher than that of conventional light water reactors, also molten salt reactors. This high temperature heat can be used for various purposes, including power generation, thermochemical hydrogen production, and so on. In particular, hydrogen production using nuclear heat from HTGR offers one of the most promising technological solutions to reduce use of fossil fuels, also greenhouse gas emission. JIA selected iodine sulfur process as hydrogen approach in terms of high thermal efficiency, mass production, and no CO2 emission. 
The entire process requires only water, nuclear heat, and releases hydrogen oxygen. HTGR and IS system is considered as ultimate clean hydrogen production system. Since 1980s, JAEA has been conducting R&D on IS process. Till today, we have successfully completed three stages. Current stage is industrial material component test. The figure at right side shows test result conducted in 2019. JAEA succeeded in producing hydrogen continuously for 150 hours. Further research will be transferred technology to private company and commercial use. HTGR development and deployment plan is shown in this slide. JAEA drafted in development and deployment schedule of demonstration reactor and commercial reactors. The construction of demonstration reactor with gas turbine and hydration facility by steam reforming is expected in 2030s. The construction of the commercial reactors with gas turbine and steam reforming is expected in 2040s. Demonstration reactor with IS process will start 2040s. International collaboration is very much important for development. This slide shows our international collaboration on HTGR and R&D. JAEA has international collaboration with OECD, NEA, IAEA, GIF, EU as multilateral collaboration. Poland, UK, USA, China, Korea, Kazakhstan, and Indonesia as bilateral collaboration. Thank you for your kind attention. I will be pleased to answer your question. Thanks very much. <clears throat> so uh, let's move to our final speaker before the Q&A, uh, Dr. Aditi Verma. Please start the video. Hello, everyone. I'm Aditi Verma, and I want to talk about how reactor design and development paradigms must change as we envision a larger role for nuclear energy in our low carbon energy systems. In my work, I study nuclear reactor design practices. Uh, nuclear engineering has always valued design as an essential skill and output of the discipline, but has done little to theorize and understand the process and act of designing. So essentially all authors of nuclear engineering textbooks including the one shown here, treat design purely as an analytical activity. Nuclear engineering generally pays little attention to how the context of the design work, the designer's identity, and the socio-cultural environment all shape design choices. Nuclear engineering regards designers as perfectly rational optimizers and conditions uh, nuclear engineers to think that the public and expert ways of thinking about risk and safety are fundamentally different. In my work, I examine these long-held tenets and show them to be false. And the goal of my work is to develop a more fundamental understanding of design to improve design practice, pedagogy, and the tools with which designers work to make design practices more open and inclusive, and to use insights from design studies to inform innovation and regulation policies. So since the mid 1980s, there have been over 130 reactor design projects that have been active around the world. The designers of these reactors have been working in a variety of settings, national labs, universities, large companies, startups, sometimes in combinations of all of the above. To design reactors, large and small, based on a number of technologies. In my recent work, I've studied French and American reactor design practices, specifically across 27 American and five French reactor design projects. I constructed retrospective design narratives for these projects using interviews, journal articles, design reports, patent filings, company websites, and articles in the trade press, 
And this data and the retrospective narratives constructed from it really formed the basis for the first systematic and comparative study of nuclear reactor design practices. And this work reveals a more nuanced and complete view of design. So for example, in my work, I find that designers' conceptualizations of risk are contingent on the design setting and on their own backgrounds. Designers, when they are making some of the most significant design choices, in fact, think about risk qualitatively. And it's these qualitative conceptualizations of risk that often lead them to new design ideas. And the diverse ways in which designers think about risk actually bear striking similarities uh, with the views of publics and non-experts reported in the literature on risk perceptions. And so I think all of this is important because as we envision a larger role for reactors in low carbon energy systems, our long held design paradigms are changing. Uh, we've long designed gigawatt scale large light water reactors as grid scale sources of power. But we are now starting to design small modular, micro and even nano reactors as off the grid distributed community scale sources of heat and electricity. And as we change our design paradigms, our design practices and the ethical underpinnings of our field must also change. So as we design technologies that could potentially be integrated into communities, we really have to ask ourselves a new set of questions. Who do we design for and with? How can we scope and frame design problems inclusively? What values can and should technologies encode? Where are technologies designed and developed? And how are these sites impacted? And how can we make collective and inclusive decisions about the governance of technology? So these are the types of questions that I try to answer in my work and develop participatory and inclusive uh, design methodologies. So in closing, I will say that we have typically understood our technologies and conceptualized our roles as nuclear engineers in narrow ways. We've concerned ourselves with the science and engineering details of our technologies and designs, but in my view, our conceptualization of what constitutes nuclear engineering and what our roles as nuclear engineers should be in society can be broader. And as part of this broader view, we should think of our technologies and our roles relative to them in the fullness, the richness, and complexity of how our technologies interact with society. And in so doing, we must expand our notion of what it means to be a nuclear engineer and meaningfully engage in an ongoing two-way dialogue uh, with society. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi, and thanks to all of the speakers for their excellent presentation. So now um, we'll, we'll turn to the Q&A part of the session, and I'd like to call on my co-chair, Dr. Kohola, speaking from Finland, uh, to begin this part by putting some questions to the panelists. You're, you're on mute. Thank you very much, and uh, uh, thank you, um, and very good early morning from Finland. One of the general topics of ISEF this year is involvement of the young generation. Uh, one um, area of um, nuclear energy is the question of public acceptance and even more public engagement, which is very relevant. And the social acceptance was also mentioned on the questions coming from our, our audience today. My question is how to improve acceptance and engagement among young people. For instance, perhaps the language used to explain the potential of this or that technology is sometimes boringly technical and perhaps even deliberately misleading and perhaps nuclear industries want to blame when we 
think about commissioning, decommissioning, going critical. So is the language and vocab vocabulary used by the nuclear community to describe nuclear technology uh, an obstacle to public discourse? What, what responsibilities does the nuclear community have to facilitate public engagement in the development of the nuclear enterprise? And perhaps Professor Wer Wer Werma, would you like to elaborate this question? Yes, Dr. Kamala, thank you so much uh, for that question. I think it's a very important one. You know, I think for too long, we've described the work that we do as nuclear engineers in sort of very dry technical terms without really addressing why we do what we do. And I think we're starting to change that. And I think it's important because young people today are drawn to the field or drawn to any field uh, because of the opportunities to solve big problems. And I think with nuclear energy technologies, we definitely have uh, the opportunity to solve those big uh, big problems, climate change, uh, for example. And so I think we need to align the purpose uh, for what we do with, with, with real big um, challenges that society faces today. I think that is something that would make the field more attractive to young people. But I will also say to go back to something uh, that you you've just noted, you know, there's sort of this difference between public acceptance and public engagement. For too long, the the dialogue within the nuclear field has been one about convincing the publics and convincing society to accept nuclear technologies. And I think that framing has been mistaken on many counts. And in fact, it's been very ineffective. Uh, if we really do want these new advanced reactor technologies that are now being developed, if we really do want them to be successful and to actually be used one day, I think instead of embarking on a campaign of public acceptance, I think we need to be working towards meaningful public engagement uh, from the very earliest stages of, of designing and, and developing uh, these technologies. And then if I might just add another quick thing, you know, a, a, another important thing that we need to be doing to draw more people uh, to the field is to really look at who has been missing from the field. And here, I think a large demographic that has been missing actually is women. Uh, in, in most fields of engineering, there aren't a lot of women in the field, and this is certainly true for nuclear engineering uh, as well. And so we have to think carefully about who we've made room for at the table and, and why these people have been missing for a long time. I think women need to see uh, more role models um, in the field. And so we really have to address this pipeline problem that the field has uh, at almost every, every stage uh, of it. And so I guess to, to summarize, I would say that to attract more people uh, to the field, the field, nuclear engineering as a field needs to reinvent itself and it needs to reinvent itself not just intellectually uh, in terms of how it defines itself and its work, but also institutionally in, in, in the mechanisms that it creates for, for bringing uh, new people and new voices to the table. Thank you very much, Professor Verma. Um, then I have a couple of questions on, on SMRs. Uh, like traditional nuclear power, also SMRs continue serving as base load but we know that the need of adjustable power will increase tremendously along with renewables and their intermittency. So my question is, will SMRs be able to provide more flexible power output in their development? Another question is about their licensing. What could be done on policy level globally? Can we suggest improvements to the licensing process to enable more rapid deployment country by country licensing will limit the effect, won't it? So how can we develop global licensing? Perhaps uh, Yuru Gisan yeah, yeah. could let be me, able to let answer Let me talk this. about something and uh, yeah. uh, as for the thing, uh, you, you talked about uh, flexible power output and uh, the, in other words, the load follow operation uh, in nuclear uh, technical term. 
And uh, it's possible, and for not only for uh, by SML, and the conventional reactors can do the uh, same operation. And uh, that that's and uh, if the uh, power output by the nuclear uh, is increased, uh, I mean the, the percentage of the, uh, the power output is increased. I think it's it gets more important to uh, operate in such a way to say adjust the power output, considering the, uh, the unstable power output by uh, the re uh, renewable energy, such as solar power. And so the, 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 I believe that's a good point, and then uh, the SML can do that, but I need to talk about uh, the, not only the SMRs, but the conventional ones can uh, do the same, same, same thing. And the next point uh, you talked about was the, uh, the licensing process. And uh, SMRs or other type of new reactors use uh, very new technologies that does not uh, used uh, that were not are not used in conventional reactors such as PWRs or BWRs. So the uh, of course the uh, when we think about the license, uh, the safety first. That's no doubt. But uh, an uh, important point uh, is I think that the the new tech uh, the there is no uh, the concrete rule at this moment uh, for such new technologies, like the MHI's SML, uh, contains everything in one uh, reactor vessel, and to eliminate the uh, uh, loss of coolant accident by the break of pi big piping. So the but that that's a new concept and uh, new technology, and uh, the the licensing process should consider. Uh, such new technology uh, uh, avoiding the, the very uh, too conservative uh, say in interpretation, which, which makes the licensing process longer and which results in the, say, the construction cost higher. Uh, if I may Thank you very much. Uh, if I may, no, I, I have uh, some comments on it. Um, yes, I totally agree with the, uh, our Japanese colleague. And undeniably, SMR is have caught on fashion trend in nuclear world because of their big advantages like reduced capital cost and small footprint and uh, grid escapability and also the siting flexibility for location, which uh, large nuclear reactors is not available. More importantly, the modular design and also uh, the safety, S because sef passive for the improved safety, I mean, and uh, passive for the more light water reactors and, and, uh, and intensive, uh, enhanced uh, system for the uh, advanced reactors. So of course, on the, on the other side, we should consider about uh, disadvantage and uh, kind of challenges. So the one is challenge exactly the what you pointed out, licensing. I think the licensing is the most uh, uh, serious challenging for this uh, uh, SMR because uh, current uh, uh, licensing is typically based on the extensively for the large and single light water reactors. And uh, about the SMR, it's more like modulated, serious uh, types of construction. And also the various of the design for SMR, the, according to the IEA, they said uh, 70 different of the um, types is now developing uh, on, uh, on the design development. It means it makes different regulations. So we need more focusing on more flexible and the uh, regime for the regulatory. And uh, one of the important uh, challenges also, we should not forget about cost because uh, SMR is small, so we cannot get benefit from the small uh, core size. So uh, now is uh, uh, a uh, new, new scale is more focusing on the more serious construction modularization for more scaling up to the uh, Reactors. So in that case, economic could be improved by that modular construction. 
And final one is, of course, the safety, because the last uh, of Japan, we have a Fukushima disaster accident. Then based on that, we are working on more safety. So our uh, Japan, we have a, a techno leading technology for the HTGR, it, it have inherent safety. So that's all I wanted to say. It. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I invite Professor Lester to continue with the questions. Thank you. Um, so we have a few questions from the audience, and maybe to begin um, with a question, I think, for Dr. Feynman. The question says, Dr. Feynman showed that nuclear reduces solar PV drastically, but PV is distributed and supports load at its point of supply. And do you have any comments? Sure, um, absolutely. Thank you for the question. The example that I showed um, in the Pacific Northwest, what that really showed was that you could reduce the overall um, capacity needed to meet zero carbon goals. Um, and, and when you reduce the number of tools that you're using to reach those low carbon goals, you tend to increase costs um, we do better with diversity. And so while including nuclear does produce some decrease in, in the other tools, you end up with a more balanced and more economical system. Great, thank you. The, the next question is um, an interesting one. The question which isn't directed to anyone in particular is, how to deal with the source and, and uh, deposit of nuclear waste. Um, as we in Europe, the questioner says, as we in Europe do not consider nuclear as emission free. And so I think what the questioner is interested in here is comparing uh, nuclear emissions in the form of um, uh, nuclear waste with uh, uh, carbon emissions from fossil uh, from fossil plants, and uh, th this is a question from Europe, um, and I don't know whether anyone wants to take that one on. Okay, then perhaps yeah. Let me let me talk about, about yeah that. and uh, the yeah, that's right and uh, the. Even uh, even from uh, nuclear power plant, uh, someone say, can say that uh, that doesn't uh, the, that. Well, let me see this way: the uh, considering the uh, all the period of the nuclear power plant say, operation, including the construction and uh, to up to the decommissioning. It's true that some uh, carbon uh, will be released, like like the uh, to uh, using the construction uh, technique or the material uh, that was that would be made uh, the way uh, which uh, produces uh, uh, carbons uh, CO 2s So the uh, if even though, uh, so the, uh, if we consider all such uh, carbon emissions, the, that's true that uh, the, uh, even from nuclear power plant, uh, the, uh, it, it emits the, you, you, you cannot say uh, that's carbon uh, emission free. But uh, that's uh, same for other, say, uh, 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 power generation method. And, uh, even for solar uh, solar power, uh, carbon uh, CO two are released from the uh, say manufacturing of the solar panel. So the I, I think the point is the not uh, not talk about the uh, carbon free or the emission uh, carbon emission free. Instead, uh, we should think about the carbon neutrality. So the uh, one way is to reduce the carbon emission, and the another way uh, is to somehow to say uh, strength or strength or uh, enforce the uh, capture 
or absorption of carbon. That, that we can uh, produce new technology to absorb the carbon, then uh, we can get the, uh, achieve the carbon neutrality in the future. Thank you. Um, we have, unfortunately, m many more questions than we have time for. I think uh, we only really have time for one more. Um, and this is an interesting question, too. It's, um, the question is about inclusive design. And uh, the questioner says it's, it's an ideal target, but it's a very difficult thing to achieve because citizens don't think of themselves as um, uh, participants in or customers of nuclear energy. And I wonder whether Dr. Verma might want to comment on how it's going to be possible to engage the citizenry in the design of nuclear plants. Absolutely. Thank you for that question. I'm happy to take it. Uh, you know, for a long time when we designed these thousand megawatt nuclear reactors that were sited far from population centers, I, it is true that communities um, didn't see themselves necessarily as users uh, in the design and development of these reactors. They didn't really feel that they had a real stake. But especially as reactors get smaller with these small modular reactors, with micro reactors, and even uh, with what some designers call nano reactors, you know, these are reactors that are intended to be sited in or around communities to supply heat and electricity, including uh, potentially in remote off the grid communities. And so there is real interest in communities uh, from Alaska, communities even in Puerto Rico, um, in these kinds of reactor technologies. And so I uh, have recently been engaged in conversations, not just with these communities, uh, but also with reactor designers. And there is real, genuine, well-meaning interest from both sides in, in engaging really collaboratively, uh, not just to think about how and where to cite these technologies, but also potentially how to design and develop them uh, in the first place. The reactor designers realize that this is an important thing to be doing, and so do the communities. And so as engineers and academics in some ways, we really have our work cut out for us in that we have to rethink how we do design and we have an important role to play in, in advising um, these designers on how to do it, but also serving as a conduit from these communities to the, to the design and develop, develop, uh, developers. So that's what I'll say, but perhaps Ashley would like to add to that as well. Dr. Lester, would you, would you like to take the floor back? I appreciate that, Dr. Verma. I think I'll have to thank you. I'm afraid we're almost out of time. And maybe a last word from Dr. Korhola before we break. Well, thank you very much. I want to thank our excellent panelists for a vivid session. I also thank the organizer, uh, ISEF, for, for organizing this uh, debate. A nuclear energy can be called the safest and most efficient energy production form. Uh, it is vital in cutting emissions today. And uh, perhaps most interesting pathway is the development in small modular re reactors with the flexibility. Hopefully we can proceed with the licensing globally uh, because country by country licensing will limit the effect. This is a clear vision, clear new vision for us, actually a nuclear vision. Thank you very much. Thank you. And my thanks too to all of the panelists and to the audience for your excellent questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer all of them, but uh, I think it was an excellent session and thanks to everyone for being with us.